This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Warlord of Kor by Terry Carr Chapter 7 Ryanson spent the next two hours in town, moving through the windy streets and thinking about what Manning had said. He was right, in a way. This was no more than a foothold for the Earthmen, a touchdown point. It wasn't even a community yet. Buildings were still going up. Prices varied widely, not only between landings of spacers, but also according to who did the selling. A lot of the men here were trying some mining out on the West Flat. Their findings had so far been small, but they brought the only real income the planet had so far yielded. The rest of the town was rising on its own weight. Bars, rooming houses, laundries, and diners. Establishments which thrived only because there were men here to patronize them. Several weeks before, a few of the men had tried killing and eating the small animals who darted through the alleys. But too many of those men had died, and the practice had been quickly abandoned. And they had noticed that when those animals foraged in the refuse heaps outside the town, they died too. A few of the big corporations had sent out fieldmen to look around, but it was too soon for any industry to have established itself here. All the planet offered so far was room to expand. Despite the wide expansion of the Earthmen through the stars, a planet where conditions were at all favorable for living was not to be overlooked. The continuing population explosion, despite tight regulations on the inner worlds, had kept up with the colonization of these worlds, and new room was constantly needed. But the planet fallen, Herlage, was still new. A handful of Earthmen had come, but they had not yet brought their civilization with them. They stood precariously on the flat, waiting for more settlers to come in and build with them. If there should be trouble before more men arrived... At 600, Ryanson walked out on the dirt pack street to Manning's quarters. He met Mark Stoworth and Jules Lessingham coming out the door. They looked worried. What's wrong, he said. They didn't stop as he went by. Ask the old man, said Stoworth, going past with an uncharacteristically hurried step. Ranson went on in through the open door. Manning was in the front room, amid several crates of stunner units. He looked up quickly as Ranson entered and waved brusquely to him. Help me get this stuff unloaded, Lee. Ranson fished for his sheath knife and started cutting open one of the crates. Why are you unloading the arsenal? Because we may need it. A couple of the boys were just out at the horse pasture, and they say the friendly natives have disappeared. Jules and Stoworth? I met them on the way in. They were doing some follow-up work out there, or at least they were going to. There's not a single one of them there. Not a trace of them. Ranson frowned. They were all there this morning. They're not there now, Manning said. I don't like it. Not after what you've told me. We're going to look for them. With stunners? Yes. Right now Mara is out at the field clearing several of the flyers to use and scouting for them. Ranson stacked the boxes of weapons and power packs on the floor where Manning indicated. There are about forty of them. Blunt barrel guns with thick casings around the power packs, weighing about ten pounds each. They looked as statically blunt as anvils, but they could stun any animal at two hundred yards. Within a two-foot range, they could shake a rock wall down. How many men are we taking with us? Ryan said, asked, eyeing the stacks on the floor. Manning looked up at him briefly. As many as we can get. I'm calling a militia. Stoworth and Lessingham went into town to round up some men. So he was going ahead with a power grab. Malholm had been right. No danger had been proven yet, but that wouldn't stop Manning nor the drifters he'd been buying in the town. Killing was an everyday thing to them. How many of the Herlegy do you think we'll have to kill to make it look important to the council? Ranson asked after a moment, his voice deliberately inflectionless. Manning looked up at him in a calculating eye. Ranson met his gaze directly, daring the man to take offense. He didn't. All right, it's a break for me. Manning shrugged. 
What did you expect? This precious little opportunity on this desert rock for leadership in any sense you might approve of. He paused. I don't think it will be necessary to kill any of them. Take it easy and we'll see. Ranson's eyes were cold. All right, we'll see. But just remember I'll be watching just as closely as you. If you start any violence that isn't necessary, well, you do, Lee, said Manning. Report me to the council? They'll listen to me before they'd pay attention to complaints from a nobody who's been drifting around the outworlds for most of his life. That's all you are, you know, Lee. A drifter, a bum, like the rest of them. That's what everybody out here on the edge is, unless he does something about it. I hold the reins right now. If I decide to do something you don't like, you won't be able to stop me. Neither you nor your female friend. So Mara's against you too, Ryanson said. She made a few remarks earlier, Manning said calmly. She may regret it soon enough. Ranson looked at the man through narrowed eyes for a moment, then strapped on a gun belt and loaded one of the stunners. He snapped it into the holster carefully, wondering just what Manning had meant by his last remark. Was it a threat in any real sense, or was Manning just letting off steam? Well, they'd see about that, too. And Ranson would be watching. Within half an hour, close to sixty men had collected outside Manning's door. They were dirty and unshaven. Some of them were working in the town. A few were miners, but most of them were drifters who had followed the advance of the Star Frontier, who drank and brawled in the streets of the town, sleeping by day and raising hell at night. They stole when they could, killed when they wanted. The drifters were men who had been all over the worlds of the edge who had spent years watching new planets open for colonization and exploitation, but had never gotten their own peace. They knew the feel of these planet-fallen towns on the edge, and could talk for hours about the worlds they had seen. But they were city men, all of them. They had seen the untamed worlds, but only from the streets. They hadn't taken part in the exploring or the building, only in the initial touchdowns. When the building was done, they signed on to the spacers again and drifted to the next world further out. Ranson looked at their faces from where he stood in the doorway, listening to Manning talking to them. They were hard men, mean and sometimes vicious, nameless faces, all of them, having no place in the more developed areas of the Terran civilization. And maybe that was their own fault. But Ranson knew that they were running, not to anything, but from civilization itself running, because when an area was settled and started to become respectable, they began to see what they did not have. The temporary quarters would come down to be replaced by permanent buildings that were meant to be lived in, not just as places for sleeping. Closets and shelters for land cars, quad sense receivers and food integrators. They didn't want to see that because they hated it or because they wanted it. It didn't matter, Einstein decided. They ran and now they were here on the edge with all their anger and frustration and Manning was ready to give them way to let it out. At the side of the mob he saw a familiar grey shock of hair. Rene Malholm. Was he with them then? Ranson craned his neck for a better view and for a moment the crowd parted enough to let him see Malholm's face. He was looking directly towards Ranson, holding a dull gleaming knife flat against his thick chest and his lips were drawn back into the crooked, sardonic smile which Ryanson had seen many times. No, Malholm at least was not part of this mob. We already know which direction they went, Manning said. Lessingham will be in charge of the main body and you'll follow him. If he gives you an order, take it. This is serious business. We, don't, we won't have room for bickering. Some of us will be scouting with the flyers. We'll be in radio contact with you. When we find out where they are, we'll reconnoiter and make our plans from there. Manning paused, looking appraisingly at the faces before him. Most of you are armed already, I see. We have some extra stunners here. If you need them, come on up. But remember, the men who carry the shockers will be in front, and their business will be simply to down the horses. Any killing that's to be done will be left to those of you who have knives or anything lethal. There was a rising wave of voices from the crowd. Some men came forward for weapons. 
Ranson saw others drawing knives and hatchets, and a few of them had heavy guns, projectile type. Ranson watched with narrowed eyes. It had been a filthy maneuver on Manning's part to organize this mob, and his open acceptance of their temper was dangerous. Once they were turned loose, what could stop them? There was a sudden shouting in the back of the mob. Men surged and fell away, cursing. Ransom heard scuffling back there, and shouts of bone meeting flesh. The men at the front of the mob turned to look back, and some tried to shove their way through to the fight. A scream came from the midst of the crowd, and was answered by an exciting, angry swelling of voices around the fighting men. Suddenly Manning was among them, smashing his way through with a stunner in his hand, swinging it like a club. "'Get the hell out of the way!' he shouted, stepping quickly through the men. They grumbled and fell back to let him by, but Ranson heard the men still fighting in the rear and then he saw them. There were three of them, two men and what looked like a boy still in his teens. The boy had red hair and a dark, ruddy complexion. He was new to the outworlds. The two older men had the pallor of the edge drifters, nurtured in the artificial light of spacers and sealed survival quarters on the less hospitable worlds. The larger of the two men had a knife, a heavy blade of the type that was common out here. Many of the men used them as hatchets when necessary. This one dripped with blood. The smaller man's left arm was torn open just below the shoulder and hanging uselessly. He stood swaying in the dust, hurling a string of curses at the man with the knife, while the boy stood slightly behind him, staring with both fear and hatred in his eyes. He had a smaller knife, but he held it loosely and uncertainly at his side. Manning stepped between them. He had sized up the situation already, and he paused now only long enough to bite out three short, clipped words, which told these men exactly what he thought of them. The man with the knife stepped back and muttered something which Ryanson didn't hear. Manning raised the stunner coldly and let him have it. The blast caught the man in the shoulder and spun him around, throwing him into the crowd. Several of them went down. The long knife fell to the ground where dirt mixed with the blood on it. There was silence. Manning looked around him, swinging the stunner loosely in his hand. After a moment, he said calmly, but loud enough for all to hear, We won't have time for fighting among ourselves. The next man who starts anything will be killed outright. Now get these men out of here. He turned and strode back through the mob, while the boy and a couple of the other men took the wounded away. Malholm had moved further into the crowd. He was strangely silent. Usually he went among these men roughly and jovially, cursing them all with good-natured ease. But now he stood watching the men around him with a frown, creasing his heavily lined face. Malholm was worried, and Ryanson, seeing that, felt his stomach tighten. Manning faced the men from the front of the crowd. He stared at them shrewdly, holding each man's gaze for a few seconds. Then he grinned and said, Save it for the horses, boys. Save it for them. Ranson rode out to the field with Manning, Stoworth, and a few of the others. It was a short trip in the land car, and none of them spoke much. Even Stoworth rode silently, his usually easy flow of trivia forgotten. Ranson was thinking about Manning. He had handled the outbreak quickly and decisively enough, keeping the men in line, but it had been only a temporary measure. They would be expecting some real action soon and Manning was already offering them the herlegy. If the alarm turned out to be a false one, would he be as easily able to stop them? Or would he even try? The flyers were ready when they got to the field, but Morrow was gone. Les Harcourt met them at the radio office on the edge of the field. He was a communication man out here. He led them into the low, quick concrete construction office and shoved some forms at Manning to be signed. If there's any trouble, you'll be responsible for it, he said to Manning. The men can look out for themselves, but the flyers are company property. Manning scowled impatiently and bent to sign the papers. Where's Mara? Ryanson asked. She's already taken one of the flyers out, Harcourt said. Left ten minutes ago. We've got her screen in the next room. He waved a hand towards the door in the rear of the room. Ranson went on back and found the live set. The screen, monitored from a camera on the flyer, showed the foothills of the southern mountains over which Mara was flying. 
They were bare and blunt. The rock outcroppings which thrust up from the flat had been weathered smooth in the passage of years. Mara was passing over a low range and on to the desert beyond. Ranson picked up the mic. Mara, this is Lee. We just got here. Have you found them yet? Her voice came thinly over the speaker. Not yet. I thought I saw some movement in one of the passes, but the light wasn't too good. I'm going for that pass again. All right. We'll be going up ourselves in a few minutes. If you find them, be careful. Wait for us. He refitted the mic in its stand and rose. But as he turned to the door, her voice came again. There they are! He looked at the screen, but for a moment he couldn't see anything. Mara's flyer was coming down out of the rocky hills now, the flat stretching before her on the screen. Ranson could see the pass through which she had been flying, but there was no movement there. It took him several seconds to see the low ruins off to the right and the figures moving through them. The screen banked and turned towards them. She lowered her altitude. I see them, he said into the mic. Can't make out what they're doing on the screen. Can you see them any more clearly? They've entered one of the buildings down there, she said after a moment. I've counted almost twenty of them so far. They must all be here. Can you go down and see what they're doing? The sooner we find out, the better. Man, he's got a pretty ugly bunch of so-called vigilantes on the way out there. She didn't reply, but on the screen he saw the crumbling buildings grow larger and nearer. He could make out individual structures now. A wall had fallen and was half buried in the dust and sand. An entire roof had caved in on another building, leaving only rubble in the interior. It was difficult to tell sometimes when the original lines of the buildings had fallen. They had all been smoothed by the wind-blown sand, so that broken pillars looked almost as though they had been built that way. Smooth and upright, solitary. At last he saw the Herlegy. They were slowly mounting the steps of one of the largest of the buildings and passing into the shadows of the interior. This building was not as deteriorated as most of the others. As Mara's flyer dipped low over it, Ranson could see its characteristic lines unbroken and clear. With a start, he sat up and said hurriedly, Mara, take another close pass over that building, the one they're entering. In a moment, she came in again over the smooth stone structure, and Ranson looked closely at the screen. There was no mistaking it now. The high steep steps leading up to a colonnade which almost circled the building, the large carvings over the main entrance. You'd better sit down away from them, he said. That's the temple of Kor. But even as he finished speaking, the image on the screen jolted and rocked, and the flyer dipped even closer towards the jumbled ruins below. They're firing something. He saw that she was trying to gain altitude, but something was wrong. The buildings on the screen dipped and wavered up and down, spinning. Mara, pull up, get out of there. One of the wings is damaged, she said quickly, and suddenly there was another jolt on the screen and he heard her gasp. The picture spun and righted itself, seemed to hang motionless for a moment, and then the stone wall of one of the buildings was directly ahead and growing larger. Mara! The image spun wildly. The building filled the screen, and then it went black. He heard a crash from the speaker, cut off almost before it had sounded. The room was silent. End of chapter 7